witty, thought-provoking, and uplifting Southern Soul Livestream is a program that you'll invite your friends over to watch every week where you'll learn about interesting guests and get to share in their fascinating experiences. Tune in each Thursday evening at 8 p.m. Eastern to connect with guests from across the generations and to laugh with our eclectic hosts who are as charming as they are talented. And now, ladies and gentlemen, here's our host, Calvin. Tonight on, what, it, what, what am I calling? I'm calling it good trouble, right? And discomfort. Ooh, y'all, y'all knew last week yeah. we were talking about, we didn't, I had no idea what I was going to call a show. Right? I'm like, I don't know, right? I can call it one, this one thing, but then if I call it that, you know, p- people going to be policing, they're going to be triggered and all kinds of stuff. So this is what I'm calling it. Good trouble and discomfort. Discomfort. Navigating fragility and myth, mythology. And I just kind of kept it broad. But people with the eyes to see and the ears to, you know, hear, they know what that means. But that's enough about tonight's show. Let me introduce y'all to Suzette. Suzette, I would love for you to tell us about what you do at Thick okay. Descriptions, your background, things like that. First, if you don't mind introducing yourself, tell us about you, tell us about your organization. Hello, Suzette. Welcome to the Southern Hello, Soul World. Hello, everyone. It is wonderful to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, and great to see, hear, know that there are so many humans here. Great to be a part of this. So my name is Suzette Chang. And so let's pause right there. I I will state the obvious. I am an African-American female with an Asian last name. And so that speaks specifically to thick descriptions. So I'm going to, to, uh, thick descriptions is the organization that I'm a part of. So I'm going to uh, mix it up a little more. And all of this is true. I'm a native Californian, adopted Oklahoman that is a cultural anthropologist. I married a Jamaican, met him in Oklahoma. His last name is Chang. So let that sit for a moment. Um, He speaks Patois, does the whole Jamaican thing. His grandfather, I want to make sure I'm saying this right, migrated from Asia to Jamaica and, and left his seed. And so that's how the chain came. And we met in Oklahoma. Um, So, and as I said earlier, I'm a a cultural anthropologist, uh, realized I wanted to explore why humans do what they do at the age of five, Um, was in the Bay Area. That's where I was born and raised uh, with my mom and realized that there's this cool little kid that I want to play with. And I'm like, let's play, let's, let's do this. We're having a wonderful time being the typical African-American female mother that she was and is. She's like, okay, Suzette, it's time to go. And I'm like, ah. And then she takes it to that next level because, of course, Suzette is not doing what her mom told her to do. And so I then say, uh, she then repeats it, and this time it's a little firmer. And with my very loud five-year-old voice, I say, what about my white friend? And literally the entire department store just stands still. And at five years old, I realized that me stating the obvious made some people uncomfortable. In fact, in that case, everyone uncomfortable. So fast forward, realized that anthropology is actually a discipline. It's a study. It has been around for decades, if not, yeah, it, I almost said a century, but decades. Um, And it is a qualitative approach of understanding why people do what they do, um, which then transitioned to starting an organization here in Oklahoma called Thick Description. And what we do is we provide uh, tools and educational resources to everyone. So uh, a couple of our initiatives are STEAM and this is anthropology. Um, Don't know if you all know this, Oklahoma ranks 48th in the country as it relates to education. And so that's how we help to reduce that unfortunate but real number. Um, During school breaks, we target specific communities and where uh, education is a struggle. And we work with those kids to help uh, 
bridge that gap. Um, another initiative is called OKI or Oklahoma Educators Evolve. Um, there's a lot of wonderful human beings here that want to make a difference. However, their cultural understandings with those youth that need to help is like daylight and dark. And so we provide them with the tools and resources to do that. And then our last initiative is Elephant in the Room on Box, very similar to this platform. We talk about those big old elephants that everybody sees, kind of like when I was that five-year-old, it's like, I see her, she's white. I said she's white. Oh, oh, I'm not supposed to say it. Got it. And so that's what we do. Awesome. Awesome. You know, thank you, Suzette, for introducing that topic. And, you know, I know when you first told me about thick descriptions, I was like, wow, that's kind of cool. It's like, you know, there's a whole, you know, science, there's a whole study behind, you know, the obvious. But, you know, initially I, I was like, wait a minute, I have no idea what anthropology is. And I kind of like the way you broke it down, right? You know, tell me again, tell the audience this description of where you say, well, I think how you describe it, it's the, you know, the obvious, the, the natural. I mean, describe that to me again, because, you know, still it's it's simple, but at the same time, it's complex. Right? It's almost like we live in such a complex world. The simple things seem hard. Right. You know, do you mind kind of just describing that to us, you know, of, you know, like what are some observations that's natural that an anthropologist, you know, a culture anthropologist would be looking at? So, uh, for example, hair. Hair is a big, big deal. More so, and I can't say for men versus women, but in this case, I'll just focus on women and I'll focus specifically on African-American women. So anthropology is based on biology. So our, our DNA, um, archaeology, most people think of um, Indiana Jones, but it's a little bit more complex than that. Um, linguistics and cultural anthropology. Culturally, African-American women were expected to wear their hair a certain way for years. In fact, you and I talked about it. Madam C.J. Walker did a lot. Um, on the flip side, it made us collectively think that biologically what grows out of our head, the way it grows out, it's not okay. Oh. And so, cultural anthropologists look at things from the way businesses are run and we work to help fill those gaps. Um, why culture is in opposition of biology versus working together with biology. A reason that the natural African-American communities is so big right now because collectively African-American women are, this is, this is literally just coming out of my head I have no control over what it does and that's a problem hmm not okay so yeah anything awesome. that has to do with human beings we focus on it awesome you know I love that example um and especially last year we did this show on natural hair right yes. and we kind of reviewed the documentary and in reviewing the documentary we kind of talked about you know african americans were the only group of people not african but you know um black people only group of people you know on the planet who are judged critiqued criticized or simply made to be uncomfortable based on how the hair naturally grows out of our you know head right and i, I like the way you describe thick descriptions in anthropology because it's like wait a minute Nature says hair is going to grow like this. Thick description and culture begins to make people feel comfortable, uncomfortable with these things. And, you know, you know, dimples are good or bad. Hair is good or bad. It's like, wait, whoa, whoa. it's right. hair. It's supposed to be hair, right. Right? right? Why do we begin to add these things to it? Well, you know, Suzette, thank you for introducing this. And, you know, we're going to bring you back later today because we got a great run of show. We're going to start with Vic. And Vic is going to break down the topic of white fragility. So if you're in the virtual Facebook world, drop on down and join us at, excuse me, soulthursdays.com. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. You know, one of my excitement, Katie, is, you know, sometimes I get busy and I have all this going on and I forget that we always get surprises in the cup of caffeine. The cup of coffee. I can't even say it. I can't talk, right? The cup of <laughs> coffee. The thing I've had too much, right? <laughs> so, yeah. but the I'm thing glad is, you said it. Thank you for saying it. Lord have mercy. The cup of coffee campaign. Yeah. I can't. I can't say a lot of stuff tonight, right? But so, 
last week I was so so humbled and surprised. We had some new donors. And sometimes people donate and they're like, hey, I'm okay being public. Some people like being private. What I love about it is the surprise. Like after the show, I'll get this alert, like somebody donated. And I just so, I'm thankful. I just wanted to say thank you. And the one thing I want to do, um, Katie, is eventually bring back some of our um, donors and get them to tell us why they donated, right? Why they purchased too much coffee for the team, right? But, you know, it's a great sign of appreciation. And we thank you guys for, it doesn't matter if you purchase one cup of coffee or donate five cup of coffees, it's highly appreciated. And um, so I just want to say thank you to that. Up next is my brother from another mother. What is up, Vic? Vic, how you doing, man? Good evening. How are you? Good to see you, Vic. Good. Thank you, man. You know, it's been exciting. You know, it's has has it been a year since you've been on the show? Was it about 12 months ago since you first was on the show? Maybe not quite, but close. You know, and, and Vic, you know, I, I just got to give you your, your, your title because, you know, you, you got it, right? I remember when, you know, people were like, hey, we like Southern Soul, but can you guys, you know, be a little bit more co- multicultural? I'm like, I think we are, right? But he was like, well, we don't see no white people. And, and then I was like, okay, I know some white people. I literally said that, right? And then I called up Vic. I said, Vic, man, can you do me a favor? Can you be the first white person on Southern Soul? Vic's like, all right, right? So, and, and I'm just... I'm I'm appreciative that I could have that conversation with you. And I'm appreciative based on all the work you did in your book club, because I want to be honest, how I met Vic is so cool. You know, a, a college friend, you know, and I'm gonna let Vic do his introduction. But I remember when I first met him, I'm like, okay, this is kind of cool. And I kind of had these thoughts of these biases, right? And I was like, yeah, I don't know what's going on. But the more time I spent with Vic, I learned a lot about myself and about him. And then what I learned about myself is I'm like, first of all, I'm black. I'm African-American. I grew up in Texas. I know about racism. I know about this stuff. Through my connection with Vic, I got the inspiration to, I don't know how many books I read, five, 10, I don't know, books on racism and the history of our country of bias and pretty much everything. And I have essentially graduated to an OMG moment. So I just want to say thank you, Vic, for being that inspiration, because just because you live it don't mean you understand it. But it was through your book club and that inspiration that got me thinking about those things. So I just want to kind of say thank you to that. But I would love for you to introduce yourself again to the Southern Soul family for the people who weren't here last year and they didn't get a chance to meet you. Well, my pleasure, first of all, and, and just to kind of circle back a second ago, it was an honor to be uh, your first white guest. It's an honor to, to be back again um, on this show tonight. And, uh, you know, I think this is my favorite conversation, quite frankly, uh, to have uh, specifically about the, the concept of white fragility and, and how uh, my own personal experience with white fragility has led to, you know, me talking a lot about it. Um, once I finally understood what it was that I was experiencing when I was having my, uh, quote unquote, fragile experiences. Um, and, and we'll talk more about how, you know, that can still happen, right? I don't think that we ever get to a place where we are immune, um, as white people from the experience of white fragility. It's a very insidious thing. And, um, so, you know, we'll get to that, but, uh, just to, to say a little bit about my background, um, I came into this conversation because I started working in the HIV services arena in 2008. And that was about the time when the face of HIV, so to speak, shifted from being a white gay man to being a usually young black man of color. And the statistics have shifted at alarming rates since about that time. So much so, in fact, that the CDC about three or four years ago said that if trajectories do not somehow become interrupted, one in two black men who have sex with men will acquire HIV in their lifetime. One in two, half. Okay, this is a CDC statistic. Now, in comparison, the same statistic for white men who have sex with men is one in 11, right? One in 11. That's yeah. a huge wow. gap. Exactly. It's a huge gap. And anybody who doesn't think that, and I know that I'm most likely not speaking to anybody on this um, in this forum tonight, but anybody who thinks that a health disparity is not a real thing, 
uh, or that different circumstances apply to different lives in our society. Um, that statistic alone, I think, is um, is enough to pretty much uh, put that um, myth, since we're going to talk about some myths later on, that's a myth. Uh, health disparities are very much a reality. Um, and so learning about why, okay, that was that was where I came from as far as, okay, well, that's obviously a statistic. Why is that? What's going on? So then that led me to learning about racism. And that also led me to, for the first time in my life, being in rooms where I was the only white person and there were probably 200 people of color. Um, and so that's a really interesting position to be in when you don't understand racism. And when you were raised like I was in a little Southern bubble where you as a white person, I'll say me, have no concept of my racial identity. I have no concept of what it means to be racialized. Uh, and that's something that we talk about in this book, White Fragility, or the author does, uh, is that white people tend to have no concept of themselves as a racialized being or a race. Instead, white people in this country are socialized to see themselves as being the norm, the standard, and any other races being races or racialized. So when you have no knowledge of yourself as a racial being and you are the only white person in rooms full of 200 whatever black people, 200, 300 black people, um, you're, you're going to learn today. <laughs> <laughs> it's exactly nice. what happened to me. Nice. Exactly nice. what happened to me. Um, and thank God, uh, because my life has opened up in ways that were unimaginable uh, prior to that understanding of myself and, and understanding those dynamics in this country. And let me just say, as I said a minute ago, that work, and when I say that work, the understanding of those dynamics is work that is never finished. This is work that I am committed to doing the rest of my experience in this body. Um, because I realized that just as soon as a white person feels like they've reached a place where they get that and they no longer need to really have these conversations or they don't really need the, D the diversity, equity, and inclusion trainings anymore because they've covered it, that's the point at which we can almost be the most harmful. And that's something that uh, Robin D'Angelo, our, our book author, White Fragility author, speaks about um, as being almost nice racism. As a matter of fact, she wrote a whole book about it, a follow-up called Nice Racism. And that is that when you see yourself as being a progressive, educated, aware white person, um, then you tend to forget how you are socialized and that a lot of times bias is a very unconscious thing. So all that to say, um, I had a very powerful experience with white fragility uh, about 10 years ago. I was working in HIV. I was um, working with a, a, a very prominent Southern educational institution known as Vanderbilt University, which, by the way, is also uh, known and associated with racism and being racist and being uh, white supremacist and all of those things. And we just put it right out there because that's real. Um, I was a representative of Vanderbilt at a an organization, um, a Black Pride event, and I was the only um, white person at this particular event, and I was attending with my Black colleague. And one of our friends, who was one of our co-workers at the time, was on the mic and was making announcements and said, Vic Surreal, how's that white privilege working for you tonight? <laughs> When I tell you that I spun like the Tasmanian devil, <laughs> that's an understatement. Right. I lost my mind. I was so furious, humiliated, so concerned with the experience I was having in this space, right? So concerned with... Uh, how could my friend do that to me 
right? Attack me in this way. Here I am, a representative of the sponsoring organization. And oh yeah, we're going to just go on to this point too. <laughs> if it weren't even for this organization, this event wouldn't even be able to happen, right? Oh, oh, oh come on. that's real. That's oh. uh, listen. Any white person that was is going to listen to this or that might be on this call knows that that's real. That is real. That is real. And I experienced that thought at that time. And so, you know, what ended up happening that I see in hindsight is that I was accompanied by an angel that night. I had with me um, a colleague who I cannot imagine a person being more graceful and more effective in their role at that time. My colleague said to me, you obviously don't understand why I'm not able to support you in this moment. Well, I most certainly don't understand why you can't support me. I was very obviously just attacked in public and called out for, you know, basically being a bad person, right? Um, someone who experiences white privilege. Um, this is how I saw it at the time, mind you. Uh, and he just nodded. You know, he was like, yep, I get it. I get it. And what I also get is that your intellect has not yet caught up with your heart. And if you choose to do the work, there are resources for you with which to do the work. As a matter of fact, all you have to do is Google a few terms. And I'll be glad to tell you those terms. And you'll be off and running. More information than you could ever hope to ingest in your life. And that's pretty much all he said. And that, that day, uh, there was a shift. There was a shift for me. And it took a long time before I didn't feel wronged, though. I'll be quite honest. It took several years. And eventually, I ended up going back to that man who was on the mic that night. And we were just the two of us, you know, having a, a lunch meeting about something. And I said, you know, by the way, I just want to tell you something that happened that you probably never even thought a thing about that was one of the most important thing that's ever happened to me in my life. And I want to thank you for just being a part of it, whether conscious, unconscious, you know, what your intention was. Let me tell you what, how it changed my life. So that basically put me on a trajectory of learning uh, and being curious and more than anything, um, wanting to, understand, which means you want to listen. I had this conversation today with a good friend, and that was when you truly want to serve, you will want to listen. You will want to understand the realities of other people, regardless of what your experience is. Because when you truly want to serve, you're in a place where you understand that there are realities other than yours. Realities, real at ease. Not just what you might think people think happen. Experiences that are absolutely 100% real, authentic, viable, crucial, relevant experiences. So that led me to this book, White Fragility. Um, and basically this book gave me the, the words to call the experience that I had. Oh, that's what happened to me that night. That's exactly what that was. Um, and the thing about White Fragility is that it keeps so many important conversations from happening because when people of color, for instance, are willing to take the risk of letting a white person know how something that they did or said could be racist, a lot of times the simple word racism, the simple ter term racist 
because of the fact that white fragility is so real, will shut down a white person to the point that they can't hear anything. They can't hear the gift that they are being given. They can't listen because they're so distracted with the way our society has shaped racism to the point that it is enabled to be perpetuated. So let me say a little bit more about that. In the book, the author talks about how after the civil rights movement, racism in order to be legitimate had to be intentional and it had to be it had to be something that was very much within the understanding and um, uh, agreement of the perpetrator of the racism. Meaning, if a white person was able to say, that wasn't my intention, or you misunderstood what happened, then the racism was not considered legitimate after the civil rights movement. We have laws now that keep this from happening. So, you know, I don't agree that it was racism and therefore it's it's not racism. So very powerful in that we became a society, especially for white people, prominently for white people, where being racist became synonymous with being a bad person. It went underground in that respect. So the fact that we are socialized in a racialized system that is led by predominantly white people, the effects of that socialization go unacknowledged. Instead, racism becomes about being a good person or a bad person. If you're a bad person, you might be racist. If you're a good person, you can't possibly be racist, right? Well, so when we as white people don't have the opportunity to understand this, this is not about you being good or bad. This is about the reality of living in white skin in a society where you were socialized. We're all socialized. We don't escape that experience, period, period. And so what are the effects then of being socialized in a society where predominantly the people who make the decisions and create the systems and the structures are white. What happens? Their bias gets carried into those systems and structures. What happens when you're white? You absorb that bias, right? Most of the time, bias by nature is unconscious. So absolutely, it's possible for a good, whatever that is, white person to perpetuate racism. The, the result of the effects of their socialization. But when we keep racism in the context of good and bad people, then we spend more time as white people defending our moral character than we ever do listening to how our socialization is coming out of us, squirting out sideways a lot of times, right? And in the most inopportune and potentially harmful ways and times. Awesome. Awesome. Th th thanks for that overview. Thanks for that backdrop. You know, sure. you know, in, in having speakers, you know, share their experiences. First of all, I consider that a gift, right? Because you don't have to share that with us. And so thank you for sharing it. And I, I love a solid why, because the why begins to become the foundation of it all. Mm -hmm. You know, in jumping into the book a little bit, you know, you share with us why you chose the book. Tell us something, and I think you're going to share with us, you know, a few video snippets, but kind of, you know, give us, you know, some of, you know, because initially I remember before the book, I would hear the word white fragility. I'm like, well, I think that's that thing they do when you walk by and somebody clutch their purse. I think that's the thing to do when, you know, somebody arrives, you know, Hispanic or of color. You know, I was reading some research recently um, out of North Carolina and they begin to talk about how Hispanic people were having the same experience that black people were, were having. And before then, it was just like, well, isn't that like a black thing? You know, you, you know, people clutch their purse, isn't that, you know? But then all of a sudden, you know, the people from who had migrated from Mexico, they were like, wait a minute, what is this thing that's happening, right? 
But then they have their black friends and they're talking to their black friends like, wait, it happens to you. It happens to you. So I said it to say, you know, at first I thought, I'm like, is it that, you know, white fragility? So I didn't really get it. Right. But in stepping into this book, I begin to read and realize and Suzette, you know, feel free to share your perspective when we were kind of chatting earlier, when we were just talking about how deep it goes. It's much more than the clutching of a purse. It's much more than, you know, the locking of a door. It goes uh, so much deeper. So share, share with us, you know, your thoughts, Suzette, you know, on something, on the things that Vix have said and your perspective of, you know, white fragility when it comes to thick descriptions and the work that you do. So yeah, uh, you all may have noticed I was uh, turning my head because I was taking down some notes and thank you, Vic. Uh, one, for being so transparent. Um, and I know that's a word that's thrown around a lot. I mean that from the bottom of my heart. Thank you. Um, we need more people that look like you to be willing to do this kind of work. Um, there is a historic understanding of racism. So typically, and, and we are a visual society. So when we think of racism, we think of lynching. We think of, we think of these images that speak um, very harshly to um, the end of life. Uh, we think of the civil rights movement. I mean, we think of all of these historic images and all of us, if we were to ask anyone on uh, this conversation, we could just come um, just in a, like a few seconds and what you are speaking of, and more so what this author is speaking of, and she is an amazing human being for writing this, is it's those micro incidents that are woven into each um, of the systems here in the United States. So when you think of systems, you think of education, you think of finance, you think of all of these things, they're woven into it. And so the expectation is, as I said earlier, that to be a European American, to be white is the standard. And so not only is it who um, these human beings are, it's also the aspiration historically. And I'm bring that back to the hair. That's why black women, we pressed our hair and perm here because the aspiration was to be white versus and 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 that was also the standard when having these type of conversations with european americans that are not ready to have them it is very similar vic to what you said of what do you mean how dare you yeah and it even um in um some of the curriculum that we offer, we talk about politeness mm. and how politeness is viewed as, I'm not racist, I just said good morning to you. Um, so yeah, um, and whiteness is also, it speaks to um, an issue of it being a nationality, like to be white is to be American. So if you are white, therefore you are American. So where does that put everyone else who isn't? Let me tell you what, just real quick. I had one of the most heated discussions with somebody I love dearly about what is an all-American girl? Oh. And I said to him, I said, you know exactly what you see and what I see when we hear right. the term all-American girl. Right. Unfortunately, it doesn't look like me. Wow, wow. Well, Vic, I would love to kind of get, I would love to get a snippet um, of the author of the book, because I think you got something queued up that you sure. can share with us and just kind of tell us about the backdrop. Because in addition to the book, I think she's well documented in describing what inspired her to write that book. Exactly. Uh, let's see. So in a nutshell, what is white fragility? Well, when I coined that term, the fragility part was meant to capture how little it takes to upset white people racially. For a lot of white people, the mere suggestion that being white has meaning will cause great umbrage. Generalizing about white people. Right now, me saying white people 
uh, as if it had meaning, one, and as if I could know anything about somebody just because they're white, will cause a lot of white people to erupt in defensiveness. Mm -hmm. I think about it as the sociology of dominance. This is how we maintain our dominant positions. This is how we maintain control racially, is through this white fragility. It causes people of color to have to walk on eggshells lest uh, we lash out at them. And, you know, the consequences aren't small. Uh, I mean, at the minimum, there's all the having to take care of and all the focus that now goes to the white person who's been unjustly accused. But at the extreme, there's, there's losing your job, there's criminalization, there's institutionalization, there's uh, increased uh, blood pressure and heart disease and shorter lifespans. Wow. And I, and I really wanted to touch on, she didn't go there, but, you know, I think that it's so true that this, this conversation is so much a life and death conversation. You know, it, when we talk about what happens when unarmed men of color are shot multiple times while running away? This is life and death, period, okay? Th th this white fragility issue, this, this socialized racism, structural racism that is socialized into us, in my opinion, and I'm, not, I'm certainly not alone, we see it materialize in ways such as that. So this is, you know, I have a good friend who's, who, this conversation in general, she always says, lives are at stake. Absolutely, yes. That's why this conversation is so vital. Lives are at stake every minute that um, every time we can have this conversation, it's so important for it to happen. Um, you know, I wanted to also say how she was talking about in the clip, the mere notion that being white has meaning. That there oh. is, right, that there's something to it, that being white thing. And, and can, I can just, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, you go ahead. I was finished. I just wanted to jump in. So most people don't know that the term white does really does not exist, it was created. And so there was a time where to be white meant you were male, um, Christian, and you owned land. So that meant Jews weren't white. That meant um, Protestants weren't white. It meant, I mean, over a period of time, different humans. So it did not speak to phenotype. It, it was not a biological factor. It was a, it was a status. It was privilege. So this has existed before America was born mm -hmm. and has just been carried on. Um, a wonderful article called When Jews Became, I encourage people to read. I mean, and literally it just documents where people who phenotypically look like you were added. And, and interestingly enough, um, women were like an afterthought, even if they look like you, but that's another conversation. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Uh, you know, I, I'm getting yeah. excited just because of the excitement. And um, you were actually speaking on, and I don't remember which book, Vic, we read, where it kind of talked about the different groups who begin to almost request permission to be included in the category white, right? I think I remember it was one of the books we were going through. And I think I remember some other European groups who were not included in the white group. And over time, more and more people were supposedly adding themselves to that category. But before we get there, let me give you guys what to expect, because I want to kind of um, pause this for a second, because I'm excited. But I want to make sure that we get to I'm, I'm calling her the feature Jill because I got to make up right? I got all kinds. Of, I got to eat crow. Y'all. So just excuse me while I recover. Right. But, you know, Jill is up next. And what we're going to do after we talk to Jill and hopefully Vicky can hang out with us. We want to come back and all of us on the screen, me, you, Suzette and Jill and just kind of recap. Right. And at that recap is our opportunity to kind of just talk about everything tonight, because, you know, as we go through this, I'm thinking about the iceberg of a topic 
that we've dived into tonight. Mm -hmm. The iceberg of a topic that we've ambitiously tried to cover in 90 minutes. But we're going to get there. But at the same time, you know, you know, you can't boil an ocean. We're going to get there. We plant seeds. And I know Tamika's going to drop in the chat that article you're talking about. Because, and if you find it, please do, Suzette, share it in the chat. Because I definitely want to reference that. And when I publish this show, I'm going to make sure that the links that we're referencing, the books, the videos, are also shared. And Vic, if you don't mind sharing that um, video clip in the chat that you were um, um, playing, that'd be also. But what I let me go ahead and pull up Jill as I get her on the screen, because what I want to do, and I can only imagine her excitement, right? Because with Jill and the work she does, I can just imagine her getting excited just hearing us talk about these things. And as she's turning on her video, I want to kind of give you guys some, you know, um, some insight, you know, you know, at Southern Soul, we're kind of big time now, right? So we just mind our business. And eventually somebody like Jill, she's like, has this super PR person, right? She's like, hello, I'm super PR person and I represent Jill. And, and that's why I get the names confused, right? That's from saving face, right? And they were like, I represent Jill and I would like her to be a part of your thing at Southern Soul. I'm like, wow, y'all, okay, cool. So Jill's like, yeah, you know, I'm big time, but I ain't got with y'all, right? So I'm excited, right? That, you know, we are at a place now that, you know, instead of prospecting and finding people like like Suzanne and Vic, now people like, you know, they find us. So I'm just excited about it. But, you know, and Jill, if, you know, how are you going, um, Jill? Can you hear us? How are you doing? I can hear you. It says I can't turn on my video. I think you have to enable that. Oh, okay. I thought I had made that That's for you. That's actually I'm me. I am okay. in fact a dolphin. Cool. That image. <laughs> okay. <is pretty> cool. <laughs> I, 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 I just fixed that. And now you can. I essentially oh, turned off a bunch okay. of features tonight just because we were, you know, having such a deep topic that I want, you know, all of us to be able to have a great conversation and, you know, make sure we don't have any, I call them trolls, right? You know, like the Billy Goat Gruff, you know, I didn't realize that trolls on the internet are kind of like the troll from Billy Goat Gruff. You guys remember Billy Goat Gruff? You know, they trying to cross the bridge and then the trolls like you can't cross. And I forget what they used to say, but I guess that's where the term comes from, but it's real. Anyway, Jill, thank you for being here tonight, you know, and I already saw, cause I got an alert that Jill has actually donated and bought us some coffee. So girl, thank you. What is up? I am so glad to be here. And you read my mind. You looked right through my screen, through the dolphin and into me. I was so excited to hear all of this and to be here with all of you holding this heavy stuff in such a loving and heartful and light way with the heavy stuff. It just, um, yeah, we got to keep, keep some, keep some dessert, you know, on the side with the, with the main course and it is so exciting. So I tell you what, you know, you and I gonna, you know, chat for a while, and then we'll, you know, we'll we'll pull Vic and uh, Suzette into the conversation. But if you don't mind, Suzette, you know, just introducing yourself and what you do is I know you do so much, right? But the thing that really, really stuck out to me is just, you know, you had your one page and all of the awesome work you do, right? And Tamika is going to share your contact information in the chat so people can follow you and things like that. But tell us about yourself. Tell us what you do. Tell us about this thing. This these white on white you know focus groups I mean please tell us about you sure um so gosh you know I, I come by this stuff honestly um my aunt Phyllis in 1946 white Jewish woman 19 years old integrated a segregated bus and mayhem and love and Sue the driver called her n-word lover you get off the bus and she would not um, she went all the way to New York and people who would never have talked to one another, talk to one another. So I want to make a, a short film about this. So it's kind of in, I come by this interest, honestly. Um, a recent turning point came for me when um, it was after, I'm about to say something that can be traumatic. So I'm just going to mention it and then I'm going to go on. Um, after Dylan Roof committed the, multiple murders of the black churchgoers and to a person my white friends were all saying what a monster lock him up you know all these things um which was typical among my white liberal and progressive friends and I looked at this picture of this young white man and I looked at his especially his eyes and what I saw was something that actually looked familiar it looked like the look that my autism spectrum 
son used to get before he had a violent tantrum. And so I had this moment of, holy, this could, this could be my son. He is somebody's son. And I need to take this on as my issue as a white person. How do we as white people solve this heinous, horrific, yet again, fatal problem of white supremacy? And it's not going to be by heaping further shame and dissociation. Because I think a lot of the white people who were calling for him to be punished in one way or another were not actually expressing um, care or concern. Am I supposed to admit the person who just, oh, somebody else did. Okay. Um, They were trying to dissociate. I'm not that bad. We need to point out that we're good white people and not bad white people like that person. Um, So then I started leaning in more and saying, wait a minute, same system that created Dylan Roof also created me and you and all of us white people. How are we going to address this? Because this is our collective problem. And it was then that I started to think about the collective white psyche as a thing and to look at it kind of as a big dysfunctional family. So think about a little family where you've got, let's say dad's an alcoholic, mom's trying to cover it up. Susie, the cheerleader is doing her perky thing and trying to distract everybody. Meanwhile, the son, let's call him Brian and this lovely white family starts abusing drugs. Now the whole family is focused on Brian. Brian is the identified patient. This is the family's way of not dealing with dad's alcoholism, which is where it all started. Because now they've got Brian focused on, oh, how are we going to help Brian? So in this big dysfunctional family of whiteness, these white people who are committing murders are expressing for the collective white body the collective distress of white supremacy mythology. They're expressing a psychosis, which is not simply of their making. This is 400 years in the making, and they are only the most visible and most fatal expressions of that psychosis. And I do think that white supremacy mythology is a kind of psychosis that warps the white mind. And I am really, really sorry. I wish I could stop it right now. I don't want any more of you and your families and any more black and brown people and my family getting harmed, period. Well, Jill, thank you for sharing that because, you know, as you shared your story, I like what you described. First of all, thank you for sharing. And I'm left speechless because as you share your story, I'm thinking about that moment where as many humans as Suzette would say, have the opportunity to dissociate. This is, I'm over here with the good people. Those are the bad people. But you did something different. You said, wait a minute. Not only that can happen in my town, not only that can happen in my neighborhood, not only that can happen in my family. You said that could happen in my household. But in sharing that story, you also told me that that wasn't always your perspective, right? As you tell the story of your family member who integrated that bus, you weren't always the person out on the front line having these white-on-white workshops. You were just an average kid, right? I mean, you you mind telling us about some of that? Well, I always had an inkling. (laughs) I always had inklings um, along these lines. I went to a high school that was 70% Cuban. Um, I came out to myself and and then later to the world as bisexual. I embraced my Judaism. I always had pretty strong anti-racist leanings and I wasn't afraid to speak up. But I hadn't thought about it as deeply and in the way that I'm thinking about it now 
um, like, the way that I think about it now is very, very detailed and complex um, in terms of, for example, the benefit to white people of dismantling white supremacy mythology. And even thinking about, um, I, I tend to, to, to use the phrase white supremacy mythology, and I do that on purpose, um, in part because racism sounds like something that some people do and some people don't, or some people are doing it more on purpose and some people doing it less consciously. It sounds like an individual thing. When we talk about white supremacy mythology, I'm referring to the, the incorrect beliefs, which is why it's a mythology, this notion that white people are somehow superior to others, which is not true, of course. Um, but it's, it's so deeply woven into our thought, the music we list, you know, that plays in a mall or the who are the superheroes on TV, who's considered beautiful, meritorious, worthwhile important who makes us comfortable and it's been dictated by white comfort zones and we're just beginning to sort of peel that away and I still get surprised at how deep and insidious like my friend and mentor and colleague Cleo Managua I don't know if he's on this call hiding out um but I'll come to him and say look we've got a show that's got black on black up he's like yes and what else did you notice about it you know, he'll put me through the steps and I'm like, oh, sh I thought, you know, I thought we were getting somewhere. Um, it's just it's so insidious and slippery and relentless and shape changing. Um, wow. And when we talk about it as white supremacy mythology, we can take a step back from who is or who isn't a racist and how racist and like, wow, so we're all impacted by this. It's in white yeah. brains, it's in black brains, it's in brown brains, you know? Yes. It's in the air. It's in the air we breathe. It is we can look in at the it air. Together. Yeah. Well, you know, Agreed. if you don't mind walking us through that, because, and then, well, I want, you know, Susan, be thinking about your questions. I know you, you're thinking of a, a few, but, you know, as we introduce this topic, first of all, I love, love, love the statement. Um, and I'm looking at my notes right now, white supremacy mythology. And I even hate that word supremacy, so I don't even use it. So I'm just calling it white mythology, right? And as I started, you know, creating the notes, I said, you know what? This mythology thing reminds me of Greek mythology. You know, Hercules and them, right? And I'm like, oh, and I was just chatting with somebody today. I'm like, hmm, I wonder back then if I'm going to have to do my Greek, you know, research. I'm like, did they really believe in Hercules and them? Or, you know, what was going on doing Greek mythology, right? So what I did is I shortened the term. I said, you know what? I'm just going to call it. I'm just gonna call it white mythology for now, right? And I, I joke, right? Because I think of some mythology such as Disney World and you know pilgrims and you know and all this other kind of stuff, right? Is in this mythology goes deep, right? It goes into history and all this other kind of stuff. But I'm you know I'm wordplay and I'm you know expanding on your term. But I love it, I love it. But before we go, well, on, let me back it. up. Go ahead. Well, can I can I ask you about your choice to to take the word supremacy out of it? I'm I'm really curious about that. My. You know, I'm a big person in words, right? You know, people, you know, I, I joke, right? High school, I took about four or five years of Latin, right? And, and I, I love words, right? And in loving words, you know, I believe that with certain words, you can speak power to a certain thing. And, you know, so for me, I don't like the word because I'm like, yeah, you kind of speak in power. No, don't get me wrong. It depends on the audience too, right? But for me, I'm like, yeah, I don't even speak power to that word. You know, I don't use it, right? Mm -hmm. But if I just think about the mythology for me personally, when I put emphasis on that mythology, then it really begins to, to me, to unpack, you know, how many places it shows up, right? Supremacy may show up in this, you know, world of racism, but mythology shows up in so many places. Now that's for me, as I begin to unpack it, right? But anyway, you know, you got me talking, you know, talking is for Thursday, uh, Saturday night. I tell people that's when I do more talking. But tell, tell us this, Jill, I would love for you to walk us through your, because you have this model, right? Um, you called it the white supremacy mythology, that's WSM, mindset continuum. I love a continuum, right? Walk us through that. Like, you know, I'm geeking out, right? Because I'm like, whoa. I love a you continuum. Know, yeah, I know. It's so geeky, right? Now, tell me that. about this. What is it? And how do you describe it? And how do you use it? Especially in your workshops. Like, how, how does all this work? What is a WSM mindset continuum? What is that? Okay. So um, first thing I'm going to say is that I'm sure that all of you already know it. When I start to describe it, you go, oh, yeah, yeah, I know what you're talking about. So basically, 
the, let me step back about 25 feet from him and say that my observation is that white supremacy mythology, its deep rooted history and how pervasive it is, impacts white minds as well as everybody else. And it does so in these very predictable kinds of ways. Um, and I want to go back to the, refer to something that Vic was saying. I am going to answer this. Um, but I want to give just a little bit more context. This idea of I'm a good person, right? Well, so I do think that most people are very good at heart. And our natural impulse when we find ourselves in the end of a perpetrating wrong, like we were crowded together on a bus and you just had your foot bandaged up because you got it broken or something. The bus lurches, I wind up stepping on your foot and you go, ouch, and I say, oh my God, I'm so sorry. I would want to do something to make you feel better, like try to help you elevate your foot or get some ice or help you get off, whatever it is, I would want to do something to rectify that. Otherwise I might feel ashamed or in denial, right? So white supremacy is being like for a white person being born into a culture that places us on the receiving end of unearned privileges at the expense of black and brown people. There's no one thing. When I find that out, there's nothing I can do about it as one person in this moment. And so I organize my response along a very predictable set of mindsets. And at the far, far end are the um, overt white supremacists who are like, yes, of course, white people are superior. And a lot of times these are poor and working class whites who are kind of railing against the broken promise of whiteness, but they don't have a critical analysis. They don't have, um, a lot of times they were abused um, and their own historical familial trauma is all braided up with white supremacy. And they're picking a strategy to give them a, like a temporary sugar high and feeling of belonging that, that scapegoats black and brown people and Jews and queers and, you know, on and on and on. Um, but black and brown people are bearing the brunt of this, as we know. Um, so that's one end of the continuum. And then you have somebody who may kind of feel that way, but would not go and put on a hood or storm the Capitol or burn a cross on the lawn. But they might get grumbly if one of their children were dating somebody with a darker hue and they might, you know, not hire that person. Like they're, they're harboring some of those things, even if it's not overt. And then you have sort of like the, um, the nice liberal, what maybe what Robin D'Angelo called nice racism, the nice liberal family. You know, in one of my workshops, um, I, I, you know, I, I give a hand that with these characteristics. It might've been what you were looking at Calvin in this, um, Seven-year-old woman said, Oh my God, were you into my family? This is verbatim what we were told growing up that, you know, we don't talk about this. Bringing up race is itself racist. And so this is a mythology. This is a place on the continuum where people's minds rest that feels most comfortable for them, that enables them to cope with, not transform, mind you, but cope with the absolute psychosis that is white supremacy mythology. And then so for, we're going to go further up the ladder and then there's a stage of um, kind of whoa, shaking off the haze, like there's a little blip in the matrix, like, wait, 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 wait a minute, huh, what? Like, oh my gosh, I didn't realize. And then, you know, none of this is um, necessarily very straightforward. People can shake it off and then relapse. You know, oh, this is too much. I don't want to deal with it. And then a little bit further up is, you know, the white people who will put a Black Lives Matter sign in their window, and which personally I think may be a more sort of sophisticated liberal way of dissociating. I'm not, I'm not, don't, don't break my windows. I'm not one of those white people, Black Lives Matter. Okay. Right. Um, and then there, uh, what, what uh, Vic was alluding to is um, a, I call a, a lifer, like somebody who feels that this issue is really so powerful as to really be the issue of our time. And we kind of organize our lives or significant part of our lives around trying to untangle and repair and heal it so to wow. sum up yeah let me just let me just sum up um white supremacy mythology is woven into our culture it's based on a lie white people are not superior race was invented solely for oppression and in response to this mass psychosis um white people white people's responses fall along 
along a predictable continuum from on one end, overt white supremacist, up on through good liberals who think talking about race is racist, people shaking up the haze to um, people who are dedicating their lives or a significant portion of them to dismantling this whole scary pile of um, garbage. The recent term I heard is dumpster fire. And I don't know why I like that word, right? But it's it's visual, right? And all you can think is something burning <laughs> and it smells horrible, right? Yes. And it's, it's that sensory experience, yes. It, it, it's a dumpster fire, right? Suzette, what are you thinking? Because I see you over there, you're taking notes. I mean, yes. I think you got some questions for Jill. T- t- tell me, what, what are you thinking over there? So before I go into the questions, again, thank you for sharing. Um, for being so upfront about personal experiences. Um, as I said to Vic, putting it out there that there needs to be more humans like you that are doing this. Um, you said something about mythology. And I remember taking a mythology class where we um, explored mythologies literally all over the world. And the commonality is it speaks to our values. So mythology regardless of the, and and let's use Greek mythology, for example, that was their values, that there's this man come in. So you got the sexism, you got the patriotism, you have all of this going on. And so very powerful that you use that word mythology. Um, Questionable value. (laughs) And I'll I'll let that resonate. Um, When you engage other European Americans. So my questions are, um, initially, what are their responses? And I'm not speaking just a a verbal response. What are their facial expressions saying to you? Which which European Americans? People who come to my workshops and want to do? Yes. Well, one of the first things I do is um, slow down our physical response. I work very much with the body. And so like one of the, we'll build a whole workshop around the exercise of, um, think of something that like a relative or high school friend said to you recently along the lines of, is something that was triggering like, well, you know, you're really the problem because when you bring up race, you're actually perpetuating the problem. So something that would make us kind of, you know, have a have a triggered reaction what we do is we slow down that reaction because mm-hmm. in real life we don't get to do that right we kind of have to manage our reaction right. and right. trying to think on top of that and trying right. to you right. know are we trying to preserve the relationship or do we not care you know and so we get right. we get to slow down our reaction and lo and behold stuff comes up during yes. that time we get to kind of shake it off and be with it you know and unpack it and kind of come through it um, yes. So that so that it's and then we get to practice how we want to show up, so we aren't completely caught off guard the next time we find ourselves in one of those conversations, because we've laid down a new neural pathway now. We're not kind of at the mercy of our pattern reactions. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I, I love that. that. <laughs> I, I love that, Jill. And thanks for the question, Suzette. And I'll tell you why I love it, because, you know, at the essence of what Suzette is alluding to is that, hey, it's getting ready to get real, right? It, it, it's going to be emotional. It's going to be heated. Even Vic shared his experience, right? And it was very vivid how he talked about his feelings and emotions when that person, right. you know, spotlighted him. And I like right. what you're doing, Jill, because you're saying, well, well, I know what's going to happen. So let's slow down. Let's be mindful. Right. And before we even get into this deep topic, let's go through some mindfulness. Right. And understanding where we are, what brings us joy, what brings us pain in some sort of environmental, you know, awareness. And I love that. You know, um, one more question, Suzette, because what I want to do, because I'm watching the time and I try to, you know, stay on the agenda, but I don't want to rush it. Right. So I tell you what, I, a few things. We got a few questions and I want to bring Vic back, but I want to make sure that Jill gets to share with us anything that she hasn't already shared, because I know um, we're only once again at the tip of the iceberg. So think about that question. And what I'm going to do is do Jill first and then I'm going to go to you, Suzette, and then I'm going to bring, you know, um, Vic back. Jill, you share with us the tip of the iceberg based on the work you do, the passion, 
the why you do it, the complexity, the spectrum, right, of responses of the things that people have been socialized from early on, how they should see and perceive these things. I was joking with Susan earlier. I'm like, this thing, you know, ought to be in the DSM, where they say this white supremacy mythology is in the DSM. And hey, slow down because you A, B, C. I predict that should go. Let, let's yeah. claim it. Just yeah. claim it. <laughs> yes. Let's put it in the DSM. It needs to be there. And you need white, black, and brown people getting these diagnoses. But I'm, I'm going to slow down because I'm talking too much. I'm not supposed to talk today. Jill, what haven't you already shared with us that you want to share with us? Because I know you have a book coming out. There's so much you got going on. Tell us what's going on. What's coming up next for Jill? Oh, my gosh. Well, um, Cleo Monago and I are offering coaching for um, a select few white anti-racist leaders. And I'm not saying it as a marketing thing, I'll select few, hurry. It's more like we're both so busy, so we probably only have a few slots, right? Um, if black leaders want coaching, they can go through Cleo um, because he is the proverbial man when it comes to this. And I hope you can have him on your show too because he's taught me just about everything I know that's worthwhile about this topic. Awesome. <laughs> not every single thing. But, um, and also that, you know, I can come to your church or synagogue or your your um, workplace and um, help you with this stuff and, you know, help you have conversations with other white people. Because what I found is that that is one of the single hardest things that white people have trouble doing is engaging the quote unquote racists in their life. And as Asia Davis, a woman of African descent of the Human Potential Project says, you know, when you blow off a white person in your life, one less racist in your life is not one less racist in my life. Wow. So I think it's one of the most important things white people can do is engage the other white people in our lives, not push them away and associate with them. Wow. Thank you for sharing that. Um, let's bring Vit back. And Suzette, what questions do you have? Because I know you got a lot on your mind. We got some questions. They're actually in the document that I shared with you guys ahead of time. But what I'd like to do for the sake of time, what I would like to do is I'm, I'm going to slow down. I'm going to have a mindfulness, a mindful moment. <laughs> and, and, and I'm gonna like, and I'm just going to just do my OMG. Right. And I just want to kind of recap. Right. And just bring us where we are today. We started with Suzette. And being the anthropologist, right, the career that I would have had if I wasn't so math and science and only into the bits and the bites. And much later, I began to like, wow, I love this stuff. Dollars and cents and making money and career is important, but it's the people. Suzette shared her story, her story of how she is young as five years old. It's just being a child. And start using the words that are obvious. And all of a sudden, she's being punished or shamed or something happening as even a five-year-old knows something ain't right. Anthropology is like, I'm being human. You know, that's what y'all call it. I'm going to call it. Vic shared a very, very transparent story. And, and Vic, I, I forgot that you, I think you used to be a musician, but I could see within your expression, right, how you relive that moment of when you were spotlighted to where you just like, I'm having a moment. I'm mad at a whole bunch of people, but then the redemption that comes as you recover and you grow. And Jill, I'm just about to call you our futurist, the person who's doing work on this white su supremacy, mythology, mythology, mindset continuum that I'm claiming that will be in the DSM so we can begin to help people in a way that their insurance company will pay for it. So thank you for bringing in this story and kind of beginning to see not just the past and then the present, but what the future of this topic can look like. Mm -hmm. We have my brother Vic back. Suzette, what's on your mind? Tell me what you're thinking. What question do you have for Vic? What question do you have for Jill? What are you thinking? So my questions for both Jill and Vic is, how do you see melanated humans helping you in your work? So with that said, there are uh, people of color who have taken the stance, that's literally, that's y'all problem. I'm not dealing with it. And there are many of us that want to help. We get that just how many European Americans have been allies for historically underestimated 
people. In turn, there are many of us that want to be allies in this. So what does that look like for you? Great question. I'm gonna let you guys decide who's gonna go first because Suzanne got the questions, y'all. Vic, would you like to go? I just talked a lot. <laughs> you know what I'll say is quick. And, and so uh, the word that comes to mind is critique. My melanated family can help me by supplying their critique at every possible opportunity. Awesome. And thanks for sharing that, Vic. Did you share your contact information? Because I know you're doing your book club sessions once a month, right? And, you know, tell us about that. When is the next one coming up and how can people participate in that? So the third Wednesday in August, um, and the book club is something that my friend James Crumlin and I um, just started doing as a way to number one, hold ourselves accountable for reading something every month that is in align with the work we want to be doing. And then why not invite our social media family to partake if they would so choose. So that's something that happened about uh, 18 months ago or so. So the best way to find out about that is Instagram at Vic Sorrell, V-I-C-S-O-R-R-E-L-L. And we post um, all those details uh, each month and we'd love to have uh, anybody join us. It's free. It's just a Zoom call, call and that's what we do. Awesome. And I, I threw that in, Jill, just to give you some time to think about your response. So <laughs> hopefully you think about your response and not listen to the big. But going back to Suzette's question, uh, Suzette's question, how can the melanated certain people of color who see this work that you're doing, the work that Vic's doing, and we're thinking, hey, do we that's y'all problem. You know, how do we be supportive? How do we support and be allied to the work you're doing? Any thoughts um, on what would be of value to you and the work you're doing? And for example, you work with your colleague, right? Who is an African-American male, I think, right? Based on what I observed. Oh, yeah. um, so, and, and so you probably got some firsthand experience on having that, you know, allyship, you know, um, working for you. Do you mind sharing with us some nuances or how you feel um, sure. your response to um, Suzette's question? Well, that's interesting because you put a slightly different spin out, like how can we help? What I heard from you, Suzette, I think was how do people, how do validated people help you? And um, so that was the question that I was pondering, Calvin, while you were asking Vic about his <laughs> no, oh, oh, yeah, please, please do. Yeah. I don't want to put your Suzette's questions. So, I mean, to me, like I feel, um, and like I've been feeling like slightly, um, weepy this whole time just being able to be here because um i i i see black space as being very sacred and i'm aware that even the presence or proximity of a white person can be at best irritating and at worst traumatizing um, and so for you to allow me into the space um to me feels very um very tender i feel a lot of gratitude um i feel a lot of joy um and it's something I never want to take for granted. Um, and it, it feels like I just, I learned a lot of black English tonight. Um, <laughs> That's what we, I prefer to call it KD uh, logic, but okay. Um, okay. <laughs> I didn't know a lot of those. So I got two of them somehow. Um, I was confused about the little white guy with the big head, but no, leave that alone for now. Um, so Cleo has been um, the, um, the it, it, we have an extremely deep, deep relationship, like call each other in the wee hours, talk about all kinds of shit relationship. I mean, actually not so much in the wee hours now that we're older, but we, I've known him for 30 plus years. And so we used to have just all kinds. And it's kind of a weird, it's just a weird fluke that I got to be in relationship with him because um, I met him at a, an informational meeting for a PhD program that we were both considering. And I remember I, he said something and I grabbed his arm and I was then kind of shocked that I did that because I didn't know him. And I said, I just do, I pulled back. He, he did something that was so sweet. He took my hand and he put it back on his arm. And then we both just laughed and laughed and laughed. And that night we talked for three hours and my mind was completely and utterly blown. And I found out later that he didn't really have very many white friends like maybe two and um somehow I, I was pretty persistent with him because I found him so 
interesting and educational, like for me. And and then we just got to be very, very, very deep friends. And we worked together like sporadically, but like looking at the world through his eyes, which are very, it's a very radical, not in the sense of fringy or out there, although it might be compared to some other view, but he sees the root of things and he sees the truth in a way that I find so refreshing because I've always been kind of a truth teller to a fault. And for somebody to see the world through his eyes and living in his black skin, I don't find threatening. I find it illuminating. So that's been the biggest help because he's been willing to open to me as a human. And I like deep relationships. I don't have a lot of like superficial relationships. So the gift of a, of a deep relationship with the, the few um, melanated people in my life who have chosen to open to me in that way and how, what we've developed over the years to me has been the most helpful. And all the people who have gifted us with writing books and posts and things that I get to read. Awesome. Jill, thanks for sharing that. And, you know, um, I definitely get a bit teary eyed because, you know, the way you describe it, I chuckled. And at the same time, I yearned the moment. Um, and I remember it was a episode of Big Brother where they did this thing, this invitation to the cookout, as they would call it. Right. And it was cool because it was the first time melanated people of color had one in Big Brother and they had this cookout scenario. And I loved it. And but tonight you've been invited to the Southern Soul Cookout. Vic has been invited to the Southern Soul Cookout. And what I hear is, hey, you know, Vic says, hey, hold me accountable. Help me, you know, see things that I may not see. And I hear what you're saying through your I friends. Echo and thing. I echo him too. Yeah. That, hey, you know, if you feel so, um, you know, called, invite me to the cookout. Let me talk with you. Let me spend some time with you to understand this and see it. Thank you for joining us at Southern Soul Livestream Talk Show. Join us weekly at soullivestream.com. If you're joining us live, we'll take a quick music break and then come back for a discussion with the audience.